Welcome back to State of the Stallions. This is your host, Luke Miller, here for, believe it or not, a fifth episode of State of the Stallions. And I think it's going to be a great one. Again, hopefully, we've got a wonderful interview lined up with Stallions offensive lineman Matt Kasky, who's in his second season with the Stallions, coming back after a stint with the Chargers uh, this past NFL season. And Matt is just one of the most fun, likable, pleasant guys to talk to in general and especially on the team. And so I think you're really going to enjoy hearing from him. I know I really uh, love getting the chance to talk with him some more and, and kind of debrief how it's been being in the UFL and uh, in sort of this new situation with the merged league. And so hope you enjoy that interview. Believe it or not, we are 10 days out from kickoff. And so um, I don't I don't always do this, but I did just want to put in a quick plug. If you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, followed us on social media, been liking these videos, this would be a really great time to do that just with the season coming up and then obviously getting started. We're going to be pushing out a lot of content and a lot of things that you're really not going to want to miss if you care about the Stallions. And so um, just wanted to throw that out there that if you haven't subscribed, if you haven't followed us on, on all the different platforms that we're on, which we'll include in the show notes, then this would be definitely a great time to do that. So that's enough of that. Without further ado, hope you enjoy this interview with Matt Kasky. And at the end, we'll have the roundup as we normally do, breaking down all the latest UFL and Stallions news. Welcome to State of the Stallions. Uh, really excited to have offensive lineman Matt Kasky with us here today and to chat a little bit about his life and his time with the Stallions and heading into a second season with them. Matt, how are you doing tonight, brother? Doing good, man. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me on the pod. Absolutely. No, thank you. I know you guys are in the middle of, of training camp and uh, they're they're kind of keeping you busy. So I really appreciate you being willing to to do this. Um, the first thing I got to ask, you know, re regarding training camp, before we kind of get into anything else is, I've really been stressing about this for weeks. Did you ever get your phone back? Seeing how far we can trade a paperclip with our players. I got my phone back. Yeah, that was that was a stunt. You know, I needed to get them a good good video to start off training camp. But yeah, they gave it back at the end of the day. Well, you definitely like, uh, you know, it was a great PR move by you because after watching the video, all I could think was like, oh my gosh, like Matt is the most just generous guy, like least materialistic person on the Stallions team. We got guys over here, like somebody, you know, I can't remember if it was Jojo or somebody else like took your phone and gave back like, I don't know, like a paper <laughs> clip or something like that. Um, so I was like. You know, I'm too addicted to my phone to hand it away to someone else. So, you know, kudos to you. But I'm glad to hear you got it back. Um, yeah, no, I got it back. I, I definitely love my phone too much. Too. That was probably <laughs> a good thing for me to get away from it for 30 minutes. I hear you. Um, well, the other thing I, I've, I've got to ask you from the jump here, too, is uh, for those who maybe aren't super familiar with your story, um, you are a graduate of Dartmouth, an Ivy League institution. So I have to ask, is it fair to say that you are the smartest man in the UFL? Uh, I think if you ask some of the coaches, they'd say no. But I would say, yes, I am the smartest man. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, but yeah, I mean, Dartmouth guy, proud, proud, to, proud to have went there and be representing them in the UFL. When you decided to go to Dartmouth, uh, I'm curious – um, because I, I grew up in West Virginia, played football there. I was, um, extremely mediocre at football, but I was pretty good at school. So like, you know, I kind of had this dream of, uh, you know, I got looked at by some, you know, D3, D2 type schools. I, I wasn't quite good enough to get looked at by Ivy league schools, but I kind of had this dream that like, if I was going to be good enough to play college football at that level it'd be awesome to go to an ivy league school because it would sort of check both boxes to me so I, i'm curious was dartmouth sort of like 
how much of it was the football piece that attracted you to go there versus sort of the academic reputation? Was it more one, the other kind of both, or, you know, yeah, obviously I mean, when you're, you're 17 year old guy, you know, it's like, who yeah. knows what you're thinking, but. Yeah, I th I'd say, li listen, I didn't really develop as a football player until like my senior year of high school. And that's nowadays that's after all the, you know, FBS schools, power five schools recruit. So I didn't really have, or I didn't have any FBS offers. Um, so I was looking at it and I was like, well, listen, it's not looking good that I can make a career out of football. So might as well, you know, use this to get me into a, a good school. And, but then it, I visited Dartmouth and it just clicked. It was one of those moments where, you know, people asked me what, made me make that decision it was just natural like when I was on campus and met the coaches and players it just fit and um went from there and luckily you know things kept going my way and I uh, was lucky enough to well I'm still playing football for a living so it's it's been a blessing for sure well along those lines I'm curious you know um at what point when you're in college obviously you were uh, you know very successful in college. Dartmouth had a great offense and and you were, you know, a several multi, you know, three, four year starter there. So you were a big part of that. But at what point was it kind of like, you know, maybe I can keep doing this once college is over? Because I mean, obviously, I, I, again, I'm assuming at Dartmouth, you know, you probably had some good career prospects outside of football, but you know, um, you were kind of able to go the undrafted free agent route and obviously you're still playing, you know, a handful of years later. So was there kind of a turning point at which you were kind of like, hey, I think I might want to or be able to kind of keep doing this, you know, once I, I graduate? Yeah, I mean, I kind of played both sides until the very end. Like, I was afraid to fully commit because I was afraid that I would flop and, you know, then I'd have nothing else to fall back on. So I, like, did job interviews my senior year. I like I had signed a job offer or a job contract with a company in New York and I had them attach a little addendum at the end that said if employed by NFL team contract is void so I was like all right I'm not trusting anything like this or that let's just play it safe here so I I, I didn't really there was no moment where I was like all right I'm all in on this even though I was focused on football and like winning each game and stuff like that in the season. I still wasn't like, this is a hundred percent locked in, you know, I still am not every day. I'm like, Oh, I could get cut tomorrow. Like that's just the way you got to be in football. Kind of, you can't get complacent and, or feel like you've made it. Um, Cause every time that happens then you're out of there, it seems, you know, it's like Murphy's law. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you did, um, get to the NFL level, you know, you were signed as an undrafted free agent um, with the Rams, I believe. Is that right? Initially? Yeah. Yeah. And then, but you really spent most of your time initially with the Panthers. I mean, that's where you, you kind of, you know, actually spent some time on the active roster and, and were there for a few years. So, um, you know, what was it like, I guess, when you were kind of, obviously, like you said, you know, you can't get too complacent or, or feel too settled, but um, you know, kind of going from, you know, like you said, developing kind of towards the end of your time in high school till the FCS level to then, you know, five, six years later, you're you're playing in NFL games. Um, you know, walk us through that experience a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely was not prepared to make the jump from college to the NFL. Um, just from like a professionalism standpoint, like at Dartmouth, football was like we took football seriously and everything like that. But it wasn't like a full-time job. Like you still had to focus on school and, you know, go to class and do everything like that. Whereas, you know, some guys at bigger programs maybe uh, can treat it more like a job earlier. Uh, that was the tough part of the transition for me. Like this getting the right sleep, eating the right food, doing the right recovery, um, watching film in the right way. Like, uh, and that's kind of what I think, led me to be being cut from the Rams, you know? Um, but then that, when you get cut, it's kind of like a kick in the butt. You're like, all right, I gotta, I gotta get going, like figure something out. So figured out the diet, the sleep, um, and everything like that. And it's been better since then, but obviously still, you know, working every day to 
to to get better um even i'm i'm just in such camp talk right now <laughs> like i'm yeah. using coachisms every sentence like every day getting better um but yeah no that's great and uh you know after that time those couple of years with the panthers obviously you you ended up with the stallions last year and um i feel like I'd be curious to let, let me give sort of my opinion. And then uh, as a, as a amateur person in the, in the stands, and then you can kind of tell me what sort of maybe you think or how you felt about it. But it seemed like to me that, that you all had a, um, a great offensive line. It seemed like there was at some point kind of like in the midway point through the season though, where um, it just seemed like something really kind of clicked and gelled in a way that, um, you know, and maybe unsurprisingly, obviously, like a lot of you guys had never maybe played before, but the first couple of weeks, um, it felt like you all were doing well, but, you know, um, maybe there was, we couldn't run the ball quite as well as we wanted to. Um, obviously, you know, Alex, his legs kind of yeah. covered a multitude of sins <laughs> for yeah, in terms of uh, if, if there was <laughs> somebody leaks through, right? But, you know, towards like kind of the middle and the end of the season, especially the postseason, I mean, you all sort of became um, quietly, I, I thought, the maybe the best offensive line out there. And so I'm just curious if you could kind of, you know, in terms of um, the success that you all are able to have, you know, is, is that do you feel like that's a fair assessment? And, and if so, you know, what do you feel like sort of led to um, things kind of clicking in that way? Um, I think that's a very fair assessment. Like even, you know, looking at the stats, it's, it's clear those last six weeks we were above and beyond like our running numbers and our sacks were way better in those last six weeks than uh, at any point before. And I mean, I think it's because when I think of offensive line play, it's a lot of it's like chemistry, knowing what the guy next to you is going to do and like playbook knowledge like knowing what to do on certain plays and little minor things that you don't really understand. You, you could know what you have to do, but you don't really understand what you have to do, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And we had a short training camp and the majority of the guys there weren't there the year before. So we were all getting to know each other for the first time that year, which is, you know, it happens sometimes in the NFL, but there's more, you know, continuation. And obviously in college you get, a lot of the same you know each other for four years so I think it was just the short training camp and the, a lot of the new faces that we just took time to gel and um you know better late than never you know it's it's good to have your best six weeks as the last six weeks um so yeah I think those are the reasons just chemistry and, and playbook knowledge yeah I mean um I thought you guys were uh you know I mean obviously as the season went on it seemed like the whole team sort of became more dominant um, towards the end of the year. Um, but I think you all were a huge part of that. And it's sort of a universal law in football that offensive linemen are, are never sort of given enough credit. I played quarterback in high school. So like I mm -hmm. uh, have a deep appreciation for offensive linemen because, I, I, you know, <laughs> uh, it makes a big difference if your if your offensive line is good or not. Um, <laughs> yeah. It can testify to that firsthand. So. Um, tried to, to show you all love whenever I, I could because uh, I think that you all are obviously a massive piece of uh, what was what you all were able to accomplish last year. And the the nice thing, speaking of continuity, is that pretty much all of you all are back um, this year. Um, I mean, you know, you both Coles um, and maybe I'm missing somebody else, but you know, a lot of you all had Harper, an NFL opportunity. O'Shea, yep, the. Uh... Yeah, Jameer was back. Obviously, we just traded him. Um, and, got tra and then Trev um, retired. So right, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was great walking in and like knowing the guys, knowing like okay, on this block he likes it this way. So yeah. you know, you know what I mean. It's just like it's like sliding into a, a slipper. Like, it's just comfortable. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think right after the season ended, I was super excited for you guys because you know yourself um Cole Schneider Cole Cabral like a lot of you guys got NFL opportunities which was awesome to see but then you know the downside of that for you know the for us is okay well now we got to go find guys that are as good as these guys were and and try to replace them and you know um obviously you know with with camps and the NFL and how competitive it is it just worked out such that you know we kind of got everybody back um yeah. which you know 
is um, super ideal, especially, um, I mean, you hear it all the time with these spring leagues, but like teams and it, it's kind of a general rule in football, I think, but especially in these leagues, like you kind of live or die by your, your offensive line play. So, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you kind of started to talk about it there, but maybe tell us a little bit more just how it's been in camp having so many familiar faces. Obviously there's some new guys you've thrown in the mix too, but basically the entire starting line more or less, you know, from, from last year is back. So how's it been in terms of, of kind of being able to pick up where you left off from last year? Oh, it's been great. Like you just know, how guys operate, you know, how to talk to them, how to, you know, because when, like, when I came in last year, you kind of are just stepping on eggshells, not trying to make any enemies for the first few weeks, but knowing guys there this year was just, just made it so much easier. And the new guys are great too. I mean, they've gelled in the group fast and they're great players. And we've got a new offensive line coach who's um, had a lot of experience in the, in the NFL. So it's, it's, it's great to have him here too. And he, he's fitting in um, and helping us out big time. So uh, it's been, uh, it's been way better this camp than last camp, just, you know, from a comfortability standpoint. Yeah, I, I believe that. And, you know, last year you were mostly at right tackle and, at right guard typically was D gray who's, yeah. you know, one of my favorite guys, one of my favorite stallions. Um, yeah. He, he's a character. You need to have him on the pod. He'd, he'd bring numbers for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's, he's definitely in the queue for sure. Um, but what's it like lining up next to him out, out on the field and in practice? I mean, he, I, I, I imagine it's, it, he keeps things entertaining, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe he's all business out there, but um, what's it like sort of being shoulder to shoulder with him? No, it's awesome. I mean, especially when we have a combo block, like he just does the heavy lifting and I just go along for a ride because he's one of the strongest guys I've played next to. You could just see by looking at him. I mean, um, so that's fun playing next to him. But yeah, I, you know, we have a joke going. I always got to like reel him in in games because he's trying to talk talk to the other team. And I'm like, all right, get back in the huddle. Get back. Like we have this relationship like that. So um, he's awesome to play next to, though. It's he has fun out there and that's what I like to do. Like it's, it's a game at the end of the day and you got to enjoy yourself. And I think me and him enjoy it out there when we're together. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I imagine that he would be a very fun person to be next to both because of, you know, his quick wittedness and uh, you know, he's a funny guy, but, but also he's uh, extremely massive, strong yeah, person as, <laughs> as you, as you alluded to. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of preferable to have somebody like that, which speaking of, you know, trash talking on the field, I, I was going to ask you this earlier, but I forgot, but, you know, I, I was wondering like when you were at Dartmouth, you know, uh, what was the trash talk like between Ivy league schools where you like pancake block yeah. a guy and then just be like, yeah. And my ACT score is better than yours too, man. Yeah, or like, it was all about equations and, you know, different, you know, constellations in the galaxy and, you know, just let, keep it light, light stuff like that. So, no, I mean, yeah. it's pretty normal. Like once you get on the football field, it just, you, everywhere I've been, all the football guys are pretty much the same, you know, yeah. like whichever locker room it is, NFL, Ivy League, uh, high school. I, I don't know what it is, but something about it being like a team sport with so many different positions, like it just keeps everyone like almost humble and like, uh, easy to talk to and you know so it's yeah I mean Dartmouth was pretty much the same there are definitely some some smart guys out there but uh yeah the trash talk was was standard for sure well I I, uh I looked this up before we came on here because I was curious but um if my research is accurate I think there's three Ivy League players in the UFL right now so yourself E.J. Perry, who played at Brown and is is now with yeah. Michigan, and then uh, Prince Amelie, who is at San Antonio, who played D line at U at at Penn. Oh, uh, okay. So I think I was thinking, I'm like, the UFL needs to do like one of those Celebrity Jeopardy episodes where it's like <laughs> you three, and uh, then we can really like get insight into the Ivy League like football you know, experience and culture. I think the quarterback would win. I think the quarterback would win. Well, <laughs> maybe, but, but EJ's, you know, technically he started out at Boston college and then he transferred okay. into Brown. So, oh. uh, you know, so he's not like, uh, you know, true, pure Ivy league yeah, you know, yeah. scholar <laughs> athlete. So, 
you might be able to give him a run for his money. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. I I watched some Jeopardy. My my roommate uh, at the hotel is Christian DeLaro. So we, we sometimes we'll throw it on after practice and just yell out answers and go one for 10, you know, but it's, it's <laughs> I like watching it. Well, one of my best friends uh, in West Virginia, where I'm from, he he actually went to Brown um, and is like obsessed with Jeopardy. Um, mm. And like, you know, if you watch it with him, it's like, he knows the answer to every question. And he's been trying to get on the show for like, you know, decades. Oh, um, really? Is it that yeah. hard to get on? Like you got to. Uh, apparently, yeah. Like he's applied and everything like you. And I think he actually did an interview at one point. Like, I think they interview you, you know, and they you know, I'm sure they're thinking about like pairing you up with people and kind of the TV production angle, you know, it's like, you can't, it's probably not just merely about, you know, are you smart or whatever, but he's yeah. been trying and it hasn't worked out yet, but one day he's going to get on there and, and get rich and famous and hopefully he'll Win remember me. But, uh, but yeah, because he's, he's got that like Ivy league jeopardy connection. I just, for, for you know, it's kind of stereotypical, but I associate those in my mind. No, um, I love it. I love trivia and stuff, but sporkle growing up i don't know if you know that website yep, but it's yep. like an online trivia website I used to do yep. that all the time yeah but, absolutely but. um okay well that's enough ivy league talk but uh you know back <laughs> to the back to the stallions so uh you kind of uh, you, you know mentioned this but um there's a lot of continuity as far as the players on the offensive line but as you mentioned you got a new offensive line coach um and coach gooch i uh i haven't got the chance to meet him yet or talk to him yet but when i see him like I don't know what it is, but I'm just like, this to me is the most like stereotypical offensive line coach, like just a bowling ball of a man. Like he looks like he's like, you know, I see videos of drills and stuff like that. And he's like getting down to business. So oh, yeah. um, as you mentioned, I mean, he's, he's super experienced. I think he was in the NFL. I saw for like 16 years or something like that. But um, what's it been like, you, you talked about it a little bit already, but what's it been like sort of having him as the, as kind of the new guy uh, steering the ship, so to speak for the O-line? It's been good. Like I, I always like getting new online coaches because they bring a new perspective and different drills and different um, play styles. So I love learning about football and that's always great. And his resume speaks for itself. So, you know, it, it works. Um, but he's an absolute character. You, you'll love him when you meet him. Uh, uh, Boston guy, Italian, just always, you know, having a good time and, um, you know, busting balls and it's 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 a it's funny in the in the meeting room and stuff so it's been great having him around yeah i saw when i was when i when we announced that he was gonna be the o-line coach i looked up like some uh just looked him up and then you know some old interviews came up from when he was like coaching in college like at boston college and different places and like yeah it, it, just even watching those interviews like i was cracking up some of his answers yeah. to like these reporters <laughs> questions and stuff it's nonstop uh, for sure there was a really funny one where um I can't remember if it was like Boston college or somewhere, but they asked him like the reporter was like, you know, Hey, you know, you all did pretty decent running the ball this year. Like you're, you know, and then he like interrupted the guy and he's like, decent. He's like, we're averaging like 4.9 yards per carry. He's like, I tell you how many teams right now wish they had that kind of average, you know, he's just, uh, Listen, we got to take what we can at O line. You know? That's all right. Yeah, for sure. He that's was holding our, the that's our favorite stat is yards per carry. You know? <laughs> he was holding the reporter's feet to the fire for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I, I certainly look forward to talking to him. Hopefully we'll be able to get him on here. But um, when I'm curious, uh, when you guys are, you know, practicing and uh, kind of working as a, as a team, you know, either on inside run, outside run, blitz pickup, whatever it may be, um, who would you say are, you know, one or maybe some of the toughest guys to block in practice? Um, Till, going back to last year, Till definitely – he's nonstop. Like he's just got a great motor and he stopped his first move. He's got a second. So that's always, you know, a headache uh, to go against and he's powerful. And uh, he, he just always, he's taking steps every week, you know, uh, he's definitely dedicated to the craft and see big things in his future. Uh, Deandre Tillman, I, we call him Till. So, yeah. Um, and then, well, kind of like deja vu, but not really. Uh, Carlos Davis is yeah. playing really well, but we had his twin last year who was also solid. He's, he's on the Texans now. Um, but, I mean, th those two stand out to me. I've obviously been going against Till for two years now, and most of our DNs are new, so I'm, I'm still kind of learning their games and everything like that. But uh, the group is great. I mean, there's 
know guys that you're like, all right, that's a win. Like every rep, you you got to be locked in and focused on on what you're doing, and you're gonna lose a few every day. You just gotta move on from yeah. it. You know, you gotta realize, all right, they're on our team, so this is good for us. That you know, somehow you yeah. spin it that losing a rep is good for the team. You know, <laughs> but that's that's how the offensive line mind works. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned Carlos Davis. I, you know, it is kind of just trippy when you see him out there because like they are identical twins and yeah. like you know it's like wait i thought khalil was in the nfl now it's like oh no wait we got his twin brother that's right <laughs> yeah. um so yeah um well just one or two kind of final maybe more fun questions here for you. so one so um so i wanted to have you on here but also you were brought on by popular demand i had somebody suggest bringing you on because <laughs> they saw some of the different like social media clips that the team point out put out and they were like you know matt caskey seems really funny like you you need to try and get him on there and talk to him so i'm curious um you know given your reputation as a as a humorous guy yourself who would you say is again one or, or maybe a few of the the funniest guys on the team um Paul Schneider is a great vibes guy. Like you could just tell by his stash and, you know, his game day <laughs> outfits, but he just brings the vibes every day. Always positive, always bringing up the mood, you know, uh, the, the Ricky Bobby outfit was, oh was pretty God. amazing. And that's like, you saw him in that and you're like, is he, is that a costume or is he just wearing, cause he'll cut off anything. You know, the guy's yeah. addicted to scissors. If, if his shirt has <laughs> no cuts in it, he's cutting something. Uh, so he's, he's definitely a, but uh, I mean, I I'm definitely sticking in the offensive line room because those are sure. just the guys I'm I'm around all the time. But like everyone's got their own sense of humor. Like O'Shea is so funny in his own way, but he's quiet and you don't really notice it. And then the more you get to know him, you're like, this guy's a like he's he's not overt about it, but you yeah. just hear little comments, you know, under his breath or or, or look here or there. It's just hilarious. Um, D Gray, obviously a funny guy. And, um, I mean, everyone's got their own sense of humor in the outline. I don't, I don't want anyone to get, you know, sensitive that I didn't mention their name, but, uh, <laughs> those guys definitely top the list. I mean, it sounds like the, the answer to the question is just the O-line room generally. Yeah. The O-line the, room for sure. Is yeah. the, the funniest sort of group of individuals, um, or on the Stallions roster, but, um, well, one last one for you here. So I've, I've asked a few other people this and, um, you know, you and I were talking about this before we started, you know, kind of officially recording this thing. But, um, you know, you, you spent last year in Birmingham, uh, you know, obviously right now you're, you're going to be going back and forth between Dallas and there. But, um, you know, you, you got to kind of get to know the city a little bit last year, the, the few months that you were there. And I'm, I'm curious, um, while you were there, you know, one of the things that, you know, Birmingham is a city that's often overlooked. But one of the things that people really do know and appreciate about it is that it, it kind of has great food. And so I was curious if there's any, you know, restaurants or places that you kind of fell in love with while you were there last year that maybe you're looking forward to, you know, being able to try and have when you get back on the ground in Birmingham in a couple of weeks um, or that uh, really stick out. Yeah, for sure. Um God, I'm forgetting the name. It's this Greek place that's right by the baseball stadium. Uh, oh, yeah. Tasty Town, I think. Tasty or, Town. Or, yeah. The chicken there was unbelievable. Like, that yeah. that was my DoorDash order whenever I could. <laughs> that's number one on the list uh, for sure. And then the a few of, the, like, the older, uh, more, like, traditional spots, Full Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, they showed us showed the O-line a good time last year. Yeah. And then um, it's – kind of near uh protective it's got a white and green sign is it fred's or it's it's uh it's a name I, what kind of food I'm, is it it's um barbecue oh um, it's like a cafeteria plate situation yeah but i think i know what you're talking about but family. yeah yeah <laughs> there's a lot of good barbecue spots um it's hard to keep track of all of them honestly yeah and um, then um i mean i'd always get uh santa's coffee in yeah. The morning. yeah um i don't know i think that's a chain i don't know if it's exclusively Birmingham. they've kind of I've like never seen it. yeah i think i was kind of confused about that myself they because they've kind of expanded like rapidly across sort of the birmingham like metro area and so i was trying to figure that out too i think it it maybe is in birmingham but um but they've they've kind of started to branch out more but i think it did technically start there but i could be wrong about that but 
Um, yeah, but, but it, it was nice town, right by the stadium. Tasty town, number one for sure. Um, I need that chicken. Now that I'm, I haven't <laughs> even thought about what I was going to get when we went back, but that's a hundred percent. That's the order. <laughs> that's the, the chicken place. Yeah, no, it's great, and it's—I mean—it's a newer place. It opened up in the last couple of years, um, like maybe the year before you—you uh, you ended up in Birmingham, and um, but yeah, it's a—it's a great spot, and it's—you um, know—it's—it's it's big and nice. If you—you you know, people in Birmingham, if you have the the chance to swing by, it's close to the stadium, like you said, and uh, good people brewing and stuff like that. So it's a, a fun little area there by the by the park. So. Yeah, that's the one I didn't really get to check out the nightlife as much, uh, like the breweries and stuff. So that's the one part of my Birmingham experience that I didn't really get to see because we were in season and stuff. So. Yeah. Well, you know, we appreciate you being all business and uh, <laughs> and and bringing us another championship. We won't we won't hold that against you for sure. Yeah. Um, but Matt, thanks so much for doing this, man. Um, speaking of business, I know you, you, they, they got your plate full and, um, you, you again, like you, like you talked about earlier you're in the, you're in the middle, kind of deep into the camp life right now. So, um, again, thank you for, for doing this, but we'll definitely be excited to see you out there. Uh, before you know it, I think, you know, uh, as of today, as of us recording this, we got 12 days, uh, when yeah. this comes out, it'll be 10, uh, till, till the opening game. So, um, before you know it, we're going to, we're going to see you out there on the field. So we're really excited for that. And certainly, you know, hope you get to stay healthy and have another awesome dominant year. Yeah. Excited. Giddy up, baby. That's right. Giddy up. Thanks, man. So that's it for our interview with Stein's offensive lineman, Matt Caskey. Hope you enjoyed that. I'm, I'm sure you did again, Matt is, uh, as you probably could tell from our chat, uh, a delightful guy and, uh, hopefully you'll get the chance to hear from him again at some point this season, or maybe even interact with him after a game or something like that. But again, as always, make sure you show him some love and just thank him for being willing to come on and talk with me and share more with the rest of you all about what his experience has been like in the UFL and with the stallions. And with that being said, it's now time for the roundup where we go over all the latest news regarding the stallions and the UFL. As we inch closer to the season, of course, there is a lot of information for us to go over here. So I'll try to make this brief, but do want to, again, try to cover everything. The first thing that needs to be talked about is there's been actually a surprising amount of roster movement with the Stallions over the past week. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we had a big cut down from 75 to 58 players and let uh, about 17, 18 guys go. And so there was a whole sort of wave of cuts. But there's been a surprising amount of movement since that point. I actually wrote down uh, all the guys' names that I need to mention just because there's been that much movement over the past week or so. And so just wanted to mention a few guys and a few things that have happened if you haven't been paying attention. One, Chris Orr, who we actually had on the show two weeks ago, uh, actually recently retired from professional football. Um, Chris had an opportunity come up that he couldn't say no to uh, to be a linebacker's coach with the Baylor Bears. And um, you know, he's got a, a wife and kid. He's got a you know a family to think about. And it was just a really uh, wonderful opportunity for him to get into coaching at the, you know, FBS Power Five level, which I think is something he would like to do. Um, if you listen to that episode, you'll know that his brother, Zach Orr, is actually the defensive coordinator for the Baltimore Ravens. Um, his dad played in the NFL. So he's got a football family, a great coaching pedigree. And I think he's got a bright future ahead of him in coaching. So it's really going to be a huge loss not to have him on the team, but couldn't be more excited for him and what's in store for him. And certainly we'll be cheering him on this next year as he works with uh, the Baylor Bears. And, you know, can't wait to see where that coaching career leads him in the future. But um, did want to show him some love. The Stallions did release defensive end Carlo Kemp. And at the same time, they added wide receiver Isaiah Zuber. He was listed as a cornerback when they signed him. Uh, he can play both. He's sort of, you know, a, a precursor, I guess you could say, to Travis Hunter. But um, it, all signs indicate that he has been signed and has been practicing as a wide receiver for the Stallions. The Stallions also added defensive end John Garvin, who uh, played for Green Bay for several years, has a, a good bit of NFL experience um, and uh, I think will potentially be a really big contributor for us this year. So that was an exciting signing. Um, after Orr retired, we also signed Malik Hall, who's a linebacker, comes from a smaller, uh, you know, sort of D2 college background, so you might not recognize the name, but he actually spent this past year after signing as an undrafted free agent with the Jets, spent this past year with them, kind of he's going to be on the practice squad, actually got injured, spent some time on IR and that sort of thing. But a young guy, super athletic guy, 
uh, I think really hungry to to prove that he has what it takes to be at this level. And I'm um, really excited to see what he can do. Unfortunately, um, defensive tackle Willie Yarberry, who has been a key piece of the Stallions sort of franchise from day one, been a starter on the defensive line for two years now, was you know projected to be a third year starting defensive tackle for us hopefully going to get his third championship ring. He actually was placed on injured reserve, and I haven't yet found out what exactly the nature of his injury is, but um, injured reserve at a minimum is six weeks, so he'll be at least out for basically half the season. I'm hoping that it's something that he can come back from at the end of the season, especially maybe the postseason, but um, that remains to be seen. It could, of of course, be something that keeps him out all year. In his place, though, excitingly, the Stallions did sign Taco Charlton, who, if you don't recognize the name, uh, was a former first-round draft pick out of Michigan a handful of years ago, went to the Dallas Cowboys, spent some time there, played in 60 NFL games, so several seasons, immediately becomes not only just on the Stallions, but in the entire UFL, one of the most NFL-experienced players in the league, and so um, he's... uh, He's kind of, you know, in terms of his career trajectory, he's not just out of college. He's a little bit older than some of the other guys we have. But in terms of talent, in terms of NFL experience, sort of veteran leadership, um, a huge addition for the Steins, especially given the fact that we we did just lose Willie Yarberry potentially for at least half, if not the entire season. And one final thing I did want to mention, there there's not a lot of clarity on this yet, but um, Victor Bolden Jr., who was the championship MVP in 2022, all USFL receiver and returner, um, has been removed from the Stallions roster online. Of course, that could be an error, but in previous cases where this has happened, it's come out a few days later that said player and whatever the situation was is no longer with the team, whether they uh, were released, whether they retired, whether they um, had to step away from the team for personal reasons, whatever it may be. So as of the recording this, not entirely sure what's going on with Victor Bolden, if he's with the team or not, but um, a little bit of an ominous sign that his name is is not currently, again, as of recording this, listed on the roster. So keep an eye out for that. Um, by the time you listen to this, you know, Wednesday or maybe Thursday, it's possible that he he could no longer be with the team for one reason or another. Hopefully we'll have some clarity on that soon. So a lot going on in terms of the roster, and we'll talk even more about that in a second. But a few other things that need to be mentioned. One is that the UFL championship will be played in St. Louis. That's going to take place on June 15th and uh, that sort of like late afternoon, early evening there. And, um, you know, hopefully, Lord willing, we will we'll be back uh, for a third championship and we'll be there at that game in St. Louis. It's a little bit closer trip than Canton, so that will be nice. The one thing I wanted to say about this, though, is that um, if you listen to some of the interviews and press, you know, the press conference that was held about the location selection for the championship, the reoccurring theme was how St. Louis earned this championship because of the turnout, because of um, the fan base there, the energy, all of those factors. It was sort of a no brainer, according to the league, to have this championship be held in St. Louis, understandably. And I hope that the Birmingham fans myself included here, hear that and accept that as a challenge that when they announce the UFL championship location in 2025, I hope that it's in Birmingham and Moose Johnston and Russ Brandon and Skip Holtz and all these different people get to have a press conference at Protective Stadium and say, the turnout was so uh, fantastic in 2024 in Birmingham and the energy was so incredible. And this team, Lord willing, being the three-time champs, deserved to have the fourth championship potentially take place here in their home city. And so probably going to be competing with a few other markets to potentially host that game in 2025. And uh, I think that that's a challenge we need to be willing to accept. And hopefully we can prove that we're worthy of, of hosting that game next, next year. Just a couple other fun things. MSX by Michael Strahan was named the official off-field apparel partner of the UFL. So if you haven't looked at the UFL shop in a week or two, uh, they do have some new things in there that uh, are a little bit different from some of the other stuff they had. So definitely would check that out if you're interested in that sort of thing. Something, um, this could be a a longer episode in and of itself, but I did want to briefly mention that um, Greg Williams, who is the defensive coordinator for the D.C. Defenders, did an interview with a Cleveland um, media group and mentioned the possibility of the UFL expanding, in his words, to 12 teams in 2025 and then 16 teams in 2026. And 
Um, if I hadn't heard some things about this from other people, I wouldn't have even brought it up. But because I have, um, I don't think that Williams is just sort of making this up out of thin air. Now, I do think the plan that he laid out of 12 teams and then 16 teams over the next two years is not going to happen. Um, I, I don't think the league is in a position to be that aggressive with expansion. But um, what's interesting to me is, and and you know, at this point, all we really know or can say is that it's pretty clear that expansion is on the table for the next year or two. Now, the reason I say that is, to me, that comes as a surprise. Given the fact that the merger cut 16 teams down to eight, I just assumed that expansion was sort of off the table um, for the near future and that they were really going to see how this went for a while, maybe for you know a handful of years before considering something like that. But I, I think there's there's been a few different signs that would maybe indicate that expansion um, could come in, in the near future. Again, Maybe not to the extent that Greg Williams sort of insinuated, but I, I don't think he just made that up. I do think there are conversations that the league is having, and um, it's just something to be aware of and to continue to monitor as we move forward. Again, um, there's nothing concrete. A lot of this is, uh, you know, in terms of exactly how and when, that's obviously at this point speculation. But the fact that this is something that the league is is sort of considering, discussing, that is on the table, I think is um, is is legitimate. One other thing I wanted to mention is that the Stains are hosting a poster competition for elementary age kids. So if you've got an elementary age kid or you know an elementary age kid in the greater Birmingham area, um, they can submit a poster that they hand draw. And there's a lot of things they can win, like they get to be on the field and be recognized. The The poster is going to be kind of pushed out on Stein social media. They get four club tickets to a game, all those kinds of uh, awesome, awesome things. So uh, if you know a, a kid in that sort of, uh, age group, then then definitely uh, would encourage them to to try that out. Let their friends know. The UFL also released a new app. Um, it's actually really just the XFL, the former XFL app, sort of revamped. But um, exciting thing that that we have. Um, you know, the USFL had an app last year too, but honestly, I didn't use it that much. I didn't find it to be super helpful. And um, this app, though, it, I, I've been impressed with it. I mean, I, obviously, you know, there's always some new features you can maybe ask for or want. But I think overall, for year one of the UFL, it's it's a really nice sort of uh, thing to have, a nice piece of technology. So if you haven't downloaded that, um, go to the App Store. You might have to search XFL or even USFL in order to get it come up. If you just search UFL, it, it uh, might not be showing up properly in there quite yet because, again, it was sort of these older apps that they they – kind of rolled into something new, but definitely download that if you haven't yet. And then a couple of final things here, again, talked a lot about roster movement and there is more roster movement on the way. So on Saturday, uh, training camp will end. The Stallions will have to make their final roster cuts of camp. Uh, they need to get the roster down to 50 people. They're at about 59 right now. They're it's technically supposed to be at 58, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but um, they have to get it down to about 50. So, you know, at least eight or nine guys are going to be released this Saturday. So, um, unfortunately that is coming. Luckily, that'll be the last sort of big wave of cuts of camp and we can move beyond that. But next week we'll, we'll have a lot to talk about in terms of the final roster for the season. And then that will bring us into week one of the regular season. So next week, when you tune into the show, we're going to have, um, some new things. We're going to be talking about the first week of the season, the first game, giving a preview of that. And um, it's going to be really awesome, really exciting. So make sure you you get ready for that and, and tune in next week when that comes out. All right, folks. Well, that will do it for week five of State of the Stallions. I really hope you enjoyed the show, the interview with Matt Kasky, and I hope the roundup was worth your time and informative. Um, again, make sure you tune in next week. We're going to be uh, kind of pedal to the metal, getting ready for the season, going to have some new things rolling out that I'm excited to, to share with you. I will just say, especially if you made it this far into listening to the episode, that if you have any feedback, comments, questions, concerns, suggestions, anything like that, I've only been at this for a handful of weeks, so uh, especially for some of my, my most faithful listeners, would love to hear any uh, thoughts that you have or anything that you would, would maybe recommend that I change or do differently or, or anything you really like. Um, and certainly we'll take that into consideration as I continue to do this into the, the season. So shoot me a DM or, or contact me, uh, leave a comment on, on YouTube whatever the case may be um, but but definitely know if you let me know if you have any feedback for me but with that being said again thank you again for tuning in 
Uh, always a privilege to get to share with you all about the Stallions and what's been going on with them. And really looking forward to uh, hitting the ground running with the season being upon us in 10 days. Giddy up.